Welcome to the Radiate Wellness Podcast. I'm your host, Christy Clemens Hoffman. Each week we will discuss tools, tips, and ways to radiate your best life ever, interviewing practitioners, authors, and luminaries to help you on your path. Wellness, joy, peace, abundance. What do you want to radiate? Hello and welcome to the Radiate Wellness Podcast. Today I am joined by Zen priest and teacher. I tell you, this is my first Zen priest. This is so exciting. So Christopher Kievel, who is the author of uh, Finding Zen in the Ordinary, and we're going to radiate the present moment. So hello, Christopher. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so glad to meet you, Christy, and I appreciate you having me on your show. Oh, that's that's very nice. I, I really am going to enjoy this very much. I've been thinking about this a lot. Just what I wanted to ask you. So, um, so finding Zen in the pre- finding Zen in the ordinary, mm. like okay. So the the front of the picture, the front of the cover. It's so nice because you've got this lovely sesame seed bun. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> is, it, is it, how can you find Zen in a roll? Ah. <laughs> I suppose well, my first question kind of off the wall. Yeah. The, um, the sesame bun is something that one can just eat and experience. And I think all of us have probably bitten into a sesame bun at some point. And it's a tangible, direct, present experience. So it's really expressing the beauty in the present moment, the uh, opportunity for us to arise in each moment. And uh, the uh, sesame bun is intended to uh, be an expression of that. Oh, I love that. Right, because there is nothing more present than eating. and Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's one of certainly a thing that brings us to our certain presence of the moment. That's very true. Right. And so there, of course, in Zen, there's such a connection between the present moment in being mindful. Mm -hmm. And so um, anyway, what, what drew you to Zen in the first Mm -hmm. place? I have always had a spiritual interest or orientation, even as a very young boy felt a connection with a greater realm than uh, just the day-to-day or to, uh, you know, keep focusing on sports or school or something. And so uh, over time, as I uh, grew up, I got to a point where I felt like if I really wanted to learn spiritual practice, it would be helpful to find someone who was a teacher, someone who had engaged for a long time in it and would be able to do something to point the way. So I started looking, I I went to yoga center and uh, different kind of meditation uh, uh, places. And I um, was at a uh, talk um, and meditation at the Cambridge Buddhist Association in uh, 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 Cambridge, Massachusetts. And it was on the evening when the uh, first Gulf War started back in uh, 1991. Right. And... uh, during the meditation, uh, someone handed a slip of paper to the person who was leading the meditation in the front of the room. And um, at the end of the meditation, he read out that the bombing had just started on Baghdad. And coming out of the meditative state and being present there, I had a very deep sense of um, personal responsibility and that the suffering that was happening had a connection to me through my tax dollars, through this being my government. Mm. And while I didn't know the politics and the policies, I knew that something deeply tragic was happening. And I felt uh, a a desire to recognize that or uh, feel uh, feel the moment through it. There was a guest uh, speaker that evening who got up in front after our meditation session and said, uh, my heart is in my mouth. All I can do is lead us in chanting to Avalokiteshvara, who is the bodhisattva, the being of compassion, who hears the cries of the world. And I was deeply moved. Some people left because they'd come to hear a talk, but I felt like he was genuinely expressing where he was coming from in that moment and expressing what was true for him. 
And I thought to myself, that I think is a person I could learn from and work with. And so I started going to practice with him in uh, Cambridge uh, at the Zen Center he was the resident teacher at. And uh, through many years now have learned a Zen practice through that student and teacher relationship, through also lots of reading, through practice on my own. But um, we've been uh, in relationship now since 1991 to the present day. I have weekly calls with him and we do koan study, which is the study of uh, uh, Zen stories, which really bring up the heart-mind awakening uh, if you go into them and have a new perception of what's going on. So it's been a training process over many years by which I think I've gained a certain level of equanimity and presence and ability to see things as they are and then act from a place of presence and in, in response. Mm -hmm. And this must have touched you very deeply because, I mean, it's one thing to find peace and, and presence in the Zen teachings and the Dharma, but then quite another to follow the process to become a priest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what drew you yeah. to take it to that level? Well, uh, in terms of the work, uh, I think several different things. One is that I... Um, feel that there is learning to be had from consistent attention to a particular path. Um, and I felt the value of investing in a particular spiritual approach to really plumb its depths and gain both the shortcomings and the challenges and the ex excellent elements and to really own that. To, to, uh, so, so, so just investment over time led me to uh, going through a precept ceremony, which is where one makes a commitment to uh, not steal or kill or use intoxicants to speak well of others. Uh, there's 10 different uh, commitments one makes. And that's done after one's been involved for some time in this practice. And uh, from that, then I uh, developed to be offered a title of Zen priest to be able to offer the teachings to other people. And uh, so that's been meaningful then to start to speak from my own awareness and truth, but in a uh, wisdom tradition to draw upon many centuries of work that's been developed through different cultures to uh, be able to share that as well. Mm -hmm. And so what was your background growing up, like in your family? Mm. What type of background did you come from? Yeah, I uh, grew up in the Boston area. Um, uh, my parents went to a Congregationalist uh, church, Christian church in town, which I attended uh, Sunday school and church services. I um, uh, uh, then started attending Quaker meeting when I was in high school. My mother got interested in, in Quaker meeting, and I was really touched by the approach of Quakers that uh, to sit in silence and allow the voice of God to arise uh, from that silence. And so to move away some from the uh, structured sense of a Christian service to uh, that more open sense of uh, hearing the voice of God in each person. And, um, and then uh, uh, I, I grew up with uh, actually nine siblings, uh, although I was second oldest, so the family grew over time. Oh, my goodness. And uh, my parents were very dedicated to service themselves. My mother... Uh, believed that one of the gifts she could offer was being a mother to many children. And actually, after having seven of her own, adopted two and had a foster child. And so was really uh, offering her services to her children. My father was a community doctor and uh, believed very much in the service he offered. In his vacations, he would go to Kentucky to a very poor community and give the opportunity for physicians in the hospital there to go on vacation because they had so few doctors that they were having trouble finding enough doctors so people could go on vacation. So he would go there regularly during over time. And for me, that sense of service in my parents, I think, led me also. Also, my grandmother uh, was a minister in the Congregationalist tradition. Oh. Um, and that also, and I would have long conversations with her as a boy. And so these things, I think, led me to feel that a life of the spirit and a life of service was something important to me. 
Oh, that's wonderful. Well, you are actually the first one to remark my about my spoons here oh. on my shelf. If you're <laughs> watching on YouTube, you'll see my spoons. And um, I'm not surprised you're the first one to notice that because, of course, there's a, an eating spoon and then a serving spoon. Of course, the message is that the serving spoon is much bigger because we're to give more than we take. Mm-hmm. So service being um, a central theme to your life and your family, mm-hmm. right? And so what did, what does your family think of you becoming uh, or going in this Zen direction, in this mm-hmm. type of direction? Mm-hmm. I think it's, there's, it's fine. Or, I mean, that there's generally support and interest. I mean, I have people in my family who are, have a variety of interests. I have a brother who is an artist, another who is a professional oboist. Uh, I have uh, two doctors and one nurse and, you know, so there's a range of different people who uh, are in my family. Uh, my mother is interested and supported. She was actually one of the readers of, of my book, Finding Zen in the Ordinary, and uh, helped me with edits and suggestions. So, yeah, there's, there's certainly support. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, so your other part of life, I suppose mm-hmm. your other hat is a management consultant which mm-hmm. you mentioned, how do you find the two complement each other or do they mm. complement each other? Yeah, I would say they very much do. I, I, uh, in the course of the Zen practice, I have uh, engaged in this process of becoming present and bringing my whole self forward to each moment. Mm. And that's no small matter because of the challenges of life and uh, um, uh, things that we're called to have to enact. And, uh, and yet in my management consulting work, um, I'm the managing director of a person, a 19 person firm that has offices around the country. Um, I've served, I think over 300 clients in the last 20 years. And uh, I'm often uh, providing uh, advice and support for leaders of colleges or youth programs or scientific research organizations. And to do that well, I have to draw upon what's deep within me as well as my knowledge of organizations and management to connect with people, to find their truth, to listen carefully, and to be a service to them. And I think the Zen practice helps me build a platform within my own personality at a deep level that I can then come from that in order to be of service to others in the job that I carry out. Absolutely. Um, I can see where there would be quite a bit of, of intertwining in Mm. that. Um, Now, do you lead with the Zen teachings in a, in a business setting? Mm. Do you even talk? I, I don't, um, Avoid it. I mean, it's listed on my LinkedIn page, and uh, it's uh, something that I mention in the bio that I often attach when we send in proposals to our, for our work. But uh, people aren't hiring our firm or me to get Zen. They're hiring us to get uh, help in their strategy or their organization. And, and so some people will bring it up, and it may be of some interest, but I tend to focus on the job at hand and bring it in as uh, a way of informing my daily work, but not something that I'm uh, uh, talking about to other people unless they ask. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So for those who might not know exactly what Zen is, I Mm -hmm. mean, uh, we we hear about it and we think, oh, Zen is a very peaceful thing, which it is, but Mm. how do you define it? Mm. Well, Zen is a a practice. Uh, It comes through many, many centuries. It actually was founded in uh, 527 by a man who came from India to China named Bodhidharma, who was considered to be the founder of Zen in China. In China, it was called by the word Chan, C-H-A-N, which means to sit. And so it was really an orientation of Buddhist spiritual practice uh, centered around sitting meditation. Um, and so I think, and in that, it is the practice of being present with this moment now in all that it brings. And this moment keeps changing in different conditions and situations and continuing to bring oneself present to that. So the meditation is practice in being present with this very moment 
which then allows one to develop that as a orientation of one's life to be present with each moment one lives. So I would say Zen is sitting meditation that brings people to a deeper sense of presence in this particular moment we're in, and therefore to act in a way that is most um, helpful, loving, uh, supportive, uh, present for others. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, perhaps this is a a really uninformed question, so I I do apologize, but I'm sure that if I have the question, others do. Of course. Here in... Uh, we hear in Buddhism, you know, the, the Noble Eightfold Path and yeah. Threefold Path. Is that, are those true in, in Zen as well? Are those part of Zen as well? They are. Uh, Zen in China, as it developed, <coughs> became um, based on Buddhism from China, but also developed a whole tradition of its own with Zen stories and koans and teacher-student relationships. And in studying Zen, one tends to be influenced more through the traditions that arose in China and then Japan and Korea, Thailand and other Asian countries. And then in the United States over the last 50, 60 years, there's been quite a substantial tradition as well. And the direct experience of awareness of the present moment, of letting go of duality, of engaging in relationship honestly, is probably more Uh, at the center of Zen than following uh, an eightfold path or a particular set of uh, guidelines. That said, Zen is very much founded on Buddhist principles. And when one takes the precepts, as I mentioned, or when uh, one is uh, chanting in Zen, uh, there's frequent reference to uh, Buddha or Buddhist principles. The eightfold path for me has been very important. I've studied it. Uh, I've reflected on it. I think my I've con- increasingly guided my life by it. And so those things do form a foundation from which Zen has grown. Mm-hmm. Well, when you were talking about the precepts, it reminded me very much of the Noble Eightfold Path. Mm-hmm. And, um, I'm mm-hmm. sure that there's quite a bit of overlap, just as there's overlap yes. in all the different type versions of Christianity, of Judaism. Yes, yeah. Right. Um, so in finding Zen in the ordinary, there are places where you include a, dia- a dialogue with your Zen teacher, mm-hmm. your Zen master. Mm-hmm. What was important about these dialogues and why did you choose to include them? Mm-hmm. One of the things I found with um, my uh, uh, relationship, my ongoing work with uh, uh, Zen master Bowman is that I've come to a deeper awareness and growth that I think would never have happened had I been practicing meditation on my own or going to um, particular events or learning in a variety of ways. Uh, It took quite a long time to develop a deep sense of trust between us. I think as is true in say a therapeutic relationship or a coaching relationship or any of those relationships, there's a period of time where trust is building. And when the trust gets deep, then it's possible to, uh, to be honest with each other in ways that may be challenging. And so, um, for instance, one of the things that I was really challenged on is that I brought in many ways to my Zen practice a hope that my pain in life, my disappointments and my senses of failure or my you know, exhaustions or all the things that we all live with, would, would get uh, alleviated and I would feel a lot less of it. And I was hoping that I, so I would talk about these things that were painful and difficult in my conversations with uh, my Zen teacher. And he would say, um, Chris, let go of the complaint. And I, I was kind of affronted at first. It was like, I'm not complaining. I'm telling you about how my life is hard. <laughs> but as I uh, continued on, I started realizing that The practice allows us to let go of a strong holding on to a sense of individual I, me, me as a separate self. Mm. Uh, In fact, we're all interconnected and we're all being influenced. And so my difficulties and pains are all shifting and changing all the time. And there's not really a one self that has these pains. And in fact, to think about them as definitional of my one self holds me from being able to see the truth of this constant shifting situation where pains and joys and opening and closing come and go all the time. And so that challenge to let go of the complaint 
and be present with what's actually going on, I think would not have happened. I wouldn't have been able to do that for myself because it was confronting and it was challenging. And so I put the dialogues in with the, my teacher, partly because the particular dialogues I shared were quite meaningful to me. They're derived from notes that I take when I talk with him. So they were just transcribed uh, from our conversations. And I thought, these are really meaningful to me. But I also did that to demonstrate the power of the relationship and that I don't think that spiritual growth is something that really happens on one's own only. There needs to be a dimension of relationship uh, to it as well in order for it to truly be broad and deep. And now I just wanted to send a shout out to some of our supporters, Julian, John, James, Marissa, Charlotte, Pauline, Becky, and Louise. Thank you all so much for keeping this podcast going. If you'd like to support this podcast too, please hit the like, follow, or subscribe button, or give us five stars or a positive review wherever you're listening and share this with your friends. You can also subscribe to Radiate You, our private Facebook group for bonus content, including classes and meditations. Another way to support our podcast is to go to radiatewellnesscommunity.com slash podcast and click on the donate now button. However you support us, we greatly appreciate it. And thanks for listening. I know I'm just trying to digest all of this right now. Sure, sure. Yeah. Right. I can imagine that, um, these dialogues would have forced you to look at some things that you were not normally looking at and to see them in a different way. Right. You know, it reminds me that Jesus taught through stories. The Bible mm -hmm. is full of these simple allegories and stories. And Buddhism is, um, you know, there are many, even, um, even Judaic texts revolve around certain dialogues yeah. and stories and things like that. Very educational and able to see mm -hmm. the principles in these these dialogues you also include your zen masters 10 principles of zen how did those come about yeah how did you think that was important to include well i found as we worked together uh we've been uh, in relationship, I've been going to retreats he's led and so on for 30 years. But over the last 10 years, um, we've been working with a weekly uh, phone calls and a very specific koan study. There's about uh, 250 koans in a traditional set that um, we've been working through. Uh, and I found that um, in um, working these through, uh, there was a process of opening. And I'm sorry, Christy, repeat your question because I started thinking about the study with my teacher. Yeah. That's okay. I am, yeah. I am fine with getting off of track because yeah. there's so much to talk about. But the question was about the 10 principles. That's right. And so as we were talking during these conversations, um, I started noticing we were kind of repeating. Uh, we would come back to different things that had come up before. Uh, I found it a little humbling because I thought I'm really not covering very much ground here because, you know, it seems like I, I think I'm having a new insight, but in fact, it's something I was thinking about a few years ago. <laughs> but uh, I raised it with him and said, well, you know, I think there's probably about 10 principles in Zen. And, and he hadn't really thought about it before, but when he reflected, he thought, you know, it's actually pretty simple in some ways. And I got curious and I said, well, well, what do you think they are? And so he started just talking and I was taking notes. And after our conversation, I looked back at the notes and I thought, you know, actually there are 10 principles here that he's laid out. And I've um, just pulled them up in your book. Yeah. And, um, you know, they include things like, um, you know, just stopping and seeing. I mean, the first principle is uh, pure possibility, that every moment contains pure possibility. Uh, but there's other things about... Um, the emotional imperative, which is we all get caught on our emotions and we think of ourselves as a separate individual with our own emotions. And that creates kind of an imperative. We have to deal with how upset we are. And that's a really central sense of actually, uh, it's not like that. We're all interconnected and it's not really my situation. And, 
And then the 10th one, which is we can't do this alone, which is we don't really learn this all by ourselves. Uh, and we are constantly in relationship with others. And that's how we learn these uh, spiritual uh, dimensions. So, so those 10 principles, uh, I then found as I wrote them out, that this book that I was writing, which had been emerging from my uh, experiences and memories, I realized, I think they're all related to these 10 principles. So I went through and started cataloging, and I realized that every one of the 10 principles was related to one or more of the stories, and every one of the stories was related to one or more of the 10 principles. And I create, created two tables in the back which showed the relationships between the principles and the stories, which means it can be kind of a study guide in that if you want to know the deeper meaning behind these very simple stories, you can see the principles that they are uh, explicating and be able to see in more depth uh, what it is that it's all driving at. And I think that is very, very helpful because we can look at the principles and go, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But unless we see how they play in our lives mm. and how they, what the, and I think that's the strength of allegory, the strength of story, mm. um, is that we see the illustration of it, which I did want to circle back a bit. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Cohen's. Yeah. In, um, you know, in Zen and of course in Buddhism too. And these are, these are stories, right? Allegory? They are. They're generally interactions between a teacher and a student, uh, or maybe, uh, certain things that the teacher suggests the student to focus on. Yes. Right. Right. Um, you know, my faith is unity, which also mm -hmm. started here in the Kansas city area. Yeah. Yeah. And right. Right, unity. Yes, world. I know about that. Yes. Right now, it's world uh, worldwide, and yeah. um, the the very first unity church is downtown in Kansas City. There's nothing else around it. It's the only building still standing in that area. But um, you know, we have a set of principles as well, twelve principles. Hmm. But they correspond so much to the ten principles mm -hmm. that you mm -hmm. outline in your book. Mm -hmm. The findings in the ordinary is just astounding. And I, I keep coming back. I just can't let go of this one sentence in principle number 10 that you have here. Um, the Sangha, which is community, right? right. That mm -hmm. we're all in this together. It's a deep democracy. Oh my gosh. That mm -hmm. to me, that's just beautiful. A deep mm -hmm. democracy. I don't know why that strikes me, but there's just so much of this that is, I mean, principles are just truths. There are things that are, that are true, no matter what the situation. So anyway, this, I thank you for including this in the book. And uh, I think it's very important. So I would urge people who are reading your book to perhaps read a couple stories and then jump ahead page 68 but that's my <laughs> personal take on it <laughs> and then um this is very this is very instructive and uh formative so i can definitely see why you'd be such a great teacher hmm. of this um and you're right that this could certainly be a textbook um, so what type of people do you think would get the most out of finding Zen in the ordinary? Well, I wrote it to be very simple and direct so that, and my hope was that anybody with uh, some interest in a uh, spiritual path or spiritual awareness would feel a resonance. They would read the stories and the vignettes and feel like, Oh, yeah, I had something like that. In fact, many of the people who have read the book uh, have spoken about that experience. Uh, it, it reminded them of their own moments of awareness, of deeper connection. And uh, in that way, I was hoping that it wouldn't be a book about Zen, but actually a direct experience of those kind of moments of Zen by just reading it. And so the intent I had was to have it be very simple in its form so that it could be directly received, it could be easy to read, you could, you know, read a little bit, put it by your, your bedside or take it on a trip or something. It didn't have to be a long novel, you'd have to wade through for uh, many uh, days, which frankly, I don't tend to have the time to read in that form these days. Right. But my, so my sense is anybody with a spiritual interest would be, uh, find it of some interest to read. I think people who are more familiar with Zen or even who are 
uh, active practitioners of Zen will then find beneath its surface and, you know, in the references in the back, a lot of uh, relations to Zen history. Mm -hmm. And so it can be both for the experienced practitioner and the person who is uh, interested uh, much more in a general way. Mm -hmm. Because there are many books out there about Zen and by different Zen practitioners. So I do feel like this is a very accessible type of book Mm -hmm. and very digestible type of book. Um, So what do you hope a reader would take away? What do you you feel is the biggest takeaway? Mm. I would hope that they feel uh, a sense of inspiration and a sense of um, possibility that um, it reminds them of things that are dear and important to them that are universal, that it gives them a sense of um, connection with others. So I would think that the style and sensibility within the book would lead people to have that experience in many cases. Right, right. Um, are there any passages you particularly like or that you think are particularly meaningful? Mm. Well, um, there was one story in here that I thought I might read if I could. It's a, just a page and a half. Uh-huh. Um, this is uh, 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 vignette 29 called Who Saved Who? Uh, I took the spring semester off in my junior year of college. Fully confused about my life's direction, I found myself back at my parents' house with no plans and nothing to do. My father, in his concern, found me a carpentry job with a middle-aged man named Jonas. Jonas had been out of work when a friend of my father hired him to repair a run-down colonial-era house. Jonas wasn't a carpenter by profession, but he was a handy and had done repairs on his own home. I was also good with my hands, but uninitiated in carpentry. Jonas became my teacher. He showed me how to handle a cat's paw to remove nails, hold a plumb bob to find true vertical, and snap a chalk line to line things up. As we worked, we talked. Mostly he talked and I listened. Not only did I learn about carpentry, I learned how he lost his family inheritance by trying to build a new tennis center. I learned how he needed willpower to avoid ordering a drink when we went out for lunch together. I learned how he felt when his wife got upset after he left unwashed dishes in the sink. And I heard his heartache when he spoke about his eldest son, who was often racked by mental illness. Jonas honored me with his teaching and attention He wished to be good to everyone and suffered from feelings of falling short. My time with Jonas changed me. His counsel and care helped me return to college the next semester and led me to work as a carpenter after college for eight years. Decades later, I returned to attend Jonas's funeral. He had died of an aneurysm. At the service, his four children talked about their father and how he had told them stories about tunnels under the lawn that led to magical places. His eldest daughter spoke to me after the service. You made a great difference to my dad, she said. That was a difficult time in his life. The way you listened to him when you were working together turned his life around. He was able to get things back together. It's the power of listening, mm. the power of being present. Mm. You didn't do anything special to help him. You just gave him that space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I love doing this podcast mm. because we keep circling back to many of the same profound messages. Yeah. Holding space, being present. Ah. Making me feel a little emotional. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. So that's a lovely story, and I, I really appreciate you sharing it. Mm-hmm. Now, um, where can someone find your book? Mm. Um, it's uh, will be on sale on Amazon uh, on March 1st and beyond. 
Um, it will be also at Borders Books and other places where books are sold. Right. It could be found uh, at uh, John Hunt Publishing's website. Uh, there's also a website for the book, uh, www.findingzeninteordinary.com. Uh, and uh, it's uh, uh, got a purchase uh, site on there as well. Wonderful. What I love is that you've got, well, first of all, you've got some really great uh, reviews on here. You've got some great blurbs. But what I love is on the retailers, you include indie bound mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is so important to me to mm -hmm. um feature you know alternatives to the big boxes mm -hmm. indie bound does great work that's mm -hmm. wonderful there's also a lovely bio and um you know just more information about the book thank you for sharing that we can also find you on linkedin if any uh yes and um there's a uh, page in my in the book there of, uh, to contact me. So if you look on that website, uh, findingzeninteordinary.com, there's a page uh, that says contact, and there's a form that people could fill out if they want to connect, and I'd be happy to hear from people. Oh, I'm sure. Absolutely. Yes, there it is. I also have a Twitter uh, handle, So and I look every day to tweet something of uh, meaning and some hopefully a gift to people. So that's at Chris Kevel. So the at sign and then C-H-R-I-S-K-E-E-V like victory, I-L, at Chris Kevel on Twitter. Oh, great. Good. I know a lot of people are on Twitter these days. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that we have not discussed that you think would be important to mention. I just want to appreciate you for this sure. interaction and for doing the show that you do. Mm -hmm. um, it's um, meaningful to people. Uh, I can tell by looking through your other shows and um, it certainly takes attention. Uh, it's not a simple thing to make this all work. And mm -hmm. so I appreciate you uh, putting yourself into this. That's very, very kind. I tell you, your publisher makes it extremely easy mm. <laughs> and sending me wonderful guests who can talk and are just kind and, and gentle. So thank you so much for being a guest. And again, the book is Finding Zen in the Ordinary by Christopher Kimmel. Thank you so much. Radiate Wellness is a community of holistic and alternative healers and consultants based in the Kansas City area dedicated to helping you create spiritual, energetic, and physical well-being. To learn more about our practitioners, services, classes, and events, or to schedule an appointment, visit us at radiatewellnesscommunity.com.